Hi, my name is Sarah Jerram and you're watching Artistic Digs. This series shines a spotlight on musical contemporaries who inspire me to talk with them and learn more about their creative space. Tara Davidson is an award-winning alto and soprano saxophonist who has performed around the world at such prestigious venues as New York City's Carnegie Hall, the acclaimed North Sea Jazz Festival in the Netherlands, the International Jazz Festival in Lima, Peru, the Jay-Z Jazz Club in Shanghai, China, and the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Davidson is a 10-time Juno Award-nominated artist. As a band leader, Davidson has produced six recordings since 2004 and performed on more than 30 recordings as a side musician. In 2020, Davidson won the Juno Award for Best Jazz Album of the Year, Group, as a member of Ernesto Cervini's Turbo Prop. She is also an active educator on faculty at the University of Toronto and York University. Thanks so much for being here, Tara. Thanks for having me, Sarah. <laughs> nice to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited. Like I uh, have been diving into listening to you and your music over the past few days. And oh my gosh, you 30 recordings. Like that's just like, I just, just scratched the surface of, of all the things that you, you've done in your career so far. So it's an honor. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, how have you been doing over this crazy, is it 19 months, 20 months? I don't know. Yeah. Um, overall, really, really good. I feel fortunate to be able to say that. Um, I'm here at my home with my husband, who's also a musician. Um, William Carn, trombonist. And yeah, I mean, being able to spend so much time together over this last year and a half um, has been a, a gift in some ways. And um, yeah, mostly also just uh, mm, reassuring or uh, we recognize we, we do really like spending time with each other, thankfully. Because <laughs> um, we're, yeah, I mean, we went through the same um, kind of losses in terms of the work that we have and had. Um, we both saw everything uh, drop away and the plans um, for, uh, I guess, yeah, musical purpose, but also, of course, income. Uh, that all fall, fell away and but we recognize yeah amongst the world that this has happened to everybody so uh, we understand one another and uh, you know are supportive of one another and um, we also we have two cats we had two cats I should say um, and uh, got to spend so much time with them both but in June we lost one of our cats his name was Murphy we actually had dedicated an album to him <laughs> you know a few years ago um, we got Murphy and our second cat Marnie who's still still with us and and lovely mm -hmm. uh, right at the beginning of our relationship so Murphy was so special but also symbolic and um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So overall, this year and a half has been great. We've learned a lot about ourselves and each other, and we have had that time together, found ways to be productive and motivate one another. And we had that time with our pets. You know, they're used, they were so used to us, you know, getting up in the morning and going off to work most days or being out late, you know, while we're at gigs most nights or sometimes tra traveling for work. You know, they didn't always have a lot of time with us, but we we were around, all of us were around one another 24-7 for, for that, you know, a lot of those uh, 18 months. So that that's a gift. That, it, that was a gift. That is a gift, absolutely. I'm sorry about Murphy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's still, it's still hard. <laughs> Family member, you know. But, and you yeah. have a dog. You get it. I yeah. do. I do. I know. And same thing. Like the gift of uh, 
the extra time with your partner and with your pets and and uh, there's been a real pack since you know sort of sensibility in our house which is really um, really nice but it's funny because like whenever my dog sees me putting on makeup now she's like huh. where are you going <laughs> oh no wow yeah she yeah. does that even no yeah. She knows, and it's like, but but no, we're supposed to all be here all the time. Mm-hmm. So even just now, I was getting ready for this, and she thought I was leaving. So it's funny, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's definitely been like a trial by fire for your pandemic partner and home life, eh? Like you know, I I, I can only yeah, I'm I'm sure it's been. Um, fantastic and wonderful for a lot of people but also challenging um or and or a mixture um learn learn about learn a lot about one another of course when you're um well yeah around each other 24 7 yeah (laughs) we also work together quite a lot so even on the rare occasions when we're leaving the house to go to work, we're often going to work together, which is great. That I mean, thankfully, like it's like okay, we we do really like each other. This is great because <laughs> yeah, no time apart, 18, 18 months. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, have you been? Um, did you do like a lot of musical stuff together while? Whilst in quarantine, I know you guys collaborate a lot in any case, but did that, did that kind of, a, how did that affect anything, if, if at all? We did get to uh, collaborate um, together with our own project. We have a band called uh, Karn Davidson Nine, his last name, my last name, there's nine of us. Um, we've had that band since, I guess we formed it at the end of 2010. And right at the beginning of the pandemic, last spring, JPEC approached William and myself asking if we wanted to do a Jazz at From Home series, uh, co- series of videos. I believe we did, we did three, four of them. And so yeah, all remotely, the nine of us recorded our parts. Uh, I believe, yeah, William William learned how to use, you know, GarageBand and maybe he got Logic even at that time. I know a lot of people have just jumped into these recording software, music making um, software programs and uh, William was one of those people. So yeah, we, we filmed these three videos that were remote recordings and then edited together um, three songs. JPEG presented that. And we applied for some grants together for the band. We, what else did we do? Well, I was also doing my master's last year. So, and I just finished. I I started it in the fall of 2019. (laughs) So I had just gotten started, almost finished the first, you know, year of the the program is at York University for composition. So, yeah, last year saw me writing music for um, for that degree. And luckily I was able to cater a lot of that writing to the ensembles that I, that I like to use. So I, I did write music for Karn Davidson 9 and um, a lot of productivity there. And I'm trying to think, I mean, William and I also get to be um, side musicians in a few projects. So Ernesto Cervini's Turbo Prop that you mentioned in in the intro. Ernesto is always working on something, as you know. You know Ernesto, and so Ernesto had also some um, uh, pandemic, you know, video performance like filming. Um, he he got that happening um, for Turbo Prop. So we did that last summer together, and then um, not with William, but um, on my own <laughs> for one project. I get to play in Andrew Downing's Otterville Ensemble, which is a six-piece um, band that he's had for a few years. I get to play in that, and he recorded a new 
album last summer. So the, I've I feel very fortunate. I've I've had some great productive, um, you know, distractions, if you will, um, that have yeah kept 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 me motivated. It's I know I know that's been challenging. I've still struggled with being self motivated, staying self motivated throughout this whole time when you have so much less to prepare for. Um, and I know that's certainly a common challenge amongst us in the in community. So I, when I had something very clear to work towards, that was very much appreciated mm -hmm. <laughs> and helpful. So. Wow. Cool. Oh my gosh. That's so amazing that you've had. Yeah. I, um, it, I know what you're saying about having concrete things, concrete goals to, I felt as well, like giving myself personal deadlines, like I'm going to finish writing this specific thing by this specific date, just, you know, whatever, because otherwise it was, I would just sit there doom scrolling on my phone, you know? <laughs> what did you call it? Doom scrolling? Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've never heard of it. It's a word. And it like, I feel like it's, oh, um. It's a real concept, actually, you know. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, but that sounds amazing, all the things that you've been working on. So do you, is, has any of this music, um, is it going to be released soon or? Yes, uh, so those, those first videos that I mentioned, so JPEG, um, I don't know if they're still on their website, but they, they are, you can find them on YouTube. So, you know, Karen Davidson 9 JPEG. Um, and then Ernesto through Ernesto Servini's website, you can find the turboprop, uh, COVID. I, I can't remember what he, what they are, what they are called. Digital the videos. Now? Is it, what is it? Canada council of digital now, right? Wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. It was yeah. through that initiative. Yeah. That those grants. Um, so that's available online. Um, Andrew Downing's Otterville recording that, we made that was in August of 2020 that we recorded together he released that in the spring of 2021 so that's out there I think at least on Bandcamp you can find it's called Lovesome uh, Andrew Downing's Otterville Lovesome it's the second recording with that ensemble it's a great one. so that's out there and then you know the music I've been writing um it all came together, as I said, we, William and I were writing grants uh, last year, and we were extraordinarily fortunate enough to receive great news in February 2021 that mm -hmm. the Canada Council for the Arts um, said yes <laughs> to, to our proposal, which was to record the Karn Davidson Nine's third uh, album. And... Um, we recorded it this summer in July and the last we're now in September so uh, all of August and very beginning of September we were uh, editing and mixing the recording with our engineer Jeff Elliott nice so the master is done and we're just working on the getting the art done with with our artist <laughs> and it's scheduled to be released this fall so digital it'll for sure be available by november uh hard copies for sure i i'm pretty sure it's like you know we're still <laughs> hoping everything you know there's no issues you know with covid and and production but uh they should be super duper complete by the end of november so it's wow. coming. Yay! I'm so Yay. excited to hear it. <laughs> That's a feat to um, not just release during a pandemic, but like to, to record and do the whole thing from top to bottom. Amazing. Yeah, the timing worked out because, you know, of lockdown measures, what they were by the time. And, and also, you know, in Canada that we're getting, we've been getting vaccinated so by the time it was time, by the time it was time <laughs> for the ensemble to, to rehearse, that was late June, we'd all uh, managed to get 
double vaccinated and um, we were able to rehearse in a really big space, open space where, you know, we all felt safe. And by the time we recorded in July, I think it's all a blur now, but yeah. by that time it was say, you know, also we were allowed to be in the studio and still really spread out, which was a challenge mm-hmm. um, when it's, it's a chamber jazz ensemble where we have no chords. It's seven horns, bass and drums. So the bass and drums were isolated as would be expected. And then the horns were all really, really spread out on the floor. We, we recorded at Revolution Studio. Nice. So, uh, but it was wonderful. It was, it was, yeah, super, super special. And so, so glad it came together, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. Amazing. Cool. Oh my gosh. We're going to be recording at Revolution, right? Yes. In March. March. I know. It's changed like so many times, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Looking forward to that. Me too. I know. It's like, um, for me, I've been so cloistered the entire time. Um, Singing being like the big, no, you know, um, of right. the virus mm. um just the idea of being in the same room singing as other people and not even outside you know like it's just such a huge jump to to for me mentally yeah, yeah. i'm excited for it to for it to happen looking yeah. forward to it me too me too just going into some of like the earlier stuff like what maybe maybe you could talk about when you started getting into saxophone and <laughs> jazz and then also I would love to know about when you started writing um mm. and, and what that process was like so three three points probably <laughs> three points and I'll try to be concise um I like a lot of Ontario kids got to start band instruments in grade seven so I was 12 when saxophone came along and I was lucky that my dad was a music teacher. He was a high school music teacher in Aurora. Oh, we, I, we grew up in Brampton. Um, he commuted a long way <laughs> to go to, to go to Aurora. He was a head of music there and he brought home the Woodwind family for me to try the, you know, the late summer of, the, the summer before grade seven, when I had to pick something, you know, I had to hand in that form, what were your top three choices. And so he brought the Woodwind family home. He himself was a trumpet player. And I'm not sure if he, cause I, I actually didn't, I don't think I had a preference at that point. I was just excited that I got to, wow, you know, start band, a band program. Mm-hmm. And he avoided bringing the brass family home, perhaps because he himself was a brass player and he just didn't want there to be too much, you know, crossover there that perhaps it would be a discouragement for me to practice the thing that my dad was into. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but I think he presented the explanation that, uh, I, I had more of a woodwind embouchure, uh, makeup that 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 would probably work better than brass probably actually my teeth back then weren't i don't know that doesn't make a difference he that's that's what he said to me so okay fine so we brought the woodwind family home and i got dizzy saw stars trying the flute of course most people do actually at the beginning but still it was unappealing and the clarinet was squeaky craziness and then the alto saxophone was quite natural came naturally actually that was it felt like a really good fit so I went forward with that and I had asked actually if I could play tenor saxophone but he said no because I had walked to school and carry it and it would have it was like a half hour walk to school so he was (laughs) looking out for me there (laughs) um yeah and in the in the home, actually, I should say that prefacing the getting to play in band finally, I had lived in a ho- I was living in a house in which there was always jazz playing. He, my dad was a jazz 
fan you know he himself when he was a young younger kid wanted to study jazz trumpet and that didn't quite work out long story but he decided to pursue education instead Mm -hmm. and but he loved jazz so much so as kids you know he would take us to new york city uh, and we heard, you know, went to Village Vanguard. That's the that's the place I remember is the Village Vanguard. Oh, and Carnegie Hall, actually. we I got to hear Dizzy Gillespie play at Carnegie Hall when I was a kid. And I thought it was amazing, but now I think, you know, that was extraordinary. You know, mm-hmm. wow, I was so lucky. Um, didn't know how lucky I was. <laughs> I was like seven. <laughs> so jazz was in my... Uh, awareness fear of consciousness you know it was it was in there and um band happened and then jazz happened though for real like me playing jazz because i just i just followed the you know the band program um model while while i was in grade seven eight i think we had a, a stage band in grade eight but improvisation didn't come until high school i um, like a lot of people in Toronto, there's quite a community at this point. I was a member of what is now called TAB, the Toronto All-Star Big Band. Yeah. Uh, so, but in the 90s, which is when I got to be a part of it, it was a government-funded program, um, like a summer job, a summer summer gig. And um, so I joined the summer of between grade 9 and 10. And it was called the Etobicoke Jazz Youth Orchestra at that time. Did you ever do that program? No, no. no. I grew up in St. Catharines. We didn't have, right. uh, yeah. But that's so cool. So how how long were you in uh, involved in that? All through high school? All through high school. Back then there was still grade 13. So I believe I chose to leave in grade 13 because by that time I was really fully into my pursuits with jazz and I was uh, applying to all the universities for the jazz performance programs. And so I was, yeah, trying to maintain my grades and focusing on these auditions. So I left, I left that band in grade 13. Um, It's where I met Ernesto Cervini. He was 11. I was 14. Yeah. And, um, a lot, a lot of wonderful people I got to meet through that that program, and it was there also that I learned about Mike Murley, who then became a you know a mentor essentially. Uh, um, I still <laughs> still look up to Mike Murley. He though we're friends and I, you know we do work together we work together lots. We've been doing that for a while, but I met him. Yeah, I started lessons with Mike when I was 15 and it was because other kids, um, I'll be specific. <laughs> Ernesto's older sister, Amy, uh, who I looked up to was taking lessons with Mike and mm-hmm. she recommended him. So I, you know, told my dad about it and he, uh, took me out to hear Mike play at the time at the Montreal Bistro when, when Toronto had that great club. And I was sold, you know, Merle, um Mike <laughs> has such a beautiful sound, uh, saxophone sound and very melodic and lyrical. And um, I didn't meet him that night, but I had heard him. And then I called him up, looked him up in the phone book, or maybe Amy gave, gave me his number. But I, yeah, I called him on the telephone and introduced myself and asked if I could study with him. And he said, yes. So... Yeah, that was a long time ago, <laughs> like 27 years. I'm way older now than Mike was when I first met him, you know, which is, time is so strange. Time is but. strange. Wow. But you did it. You made that call and uh, and then you ended up at U of T, right? Which, I ended up at U of T because Mike was teaching at U of T. So that's where I wanted to go. I wanted to keep studying with Mike. I So, yeah through high school from 15 yeah 15 years old uh onward and then I got to U of T and of course requested Mike I just wanted to you know keep the ball rolling um but I got to study with Alex they placed me with Alex Dean 
for the my first for first two years and then my last two years I uh, was back with Mike Kirk McDonald was also teaching there when I was going through the U of T program and uh, I was actually a little too scared to request him I didn't know him <laughs> yet I know now how what a um, super nice man he is and very friendly but at the time I, I I couldn't tell and I was a little a little too nervous so but I ended up studying with Kirk a little bit once I finished my degree at U of T actually oh cool wow nice yeah we were there overlapping I think what what year did you graduate I was gonna ask I know I know we met there but I, I couldn't remember so I was there 98 to 02 Okay, so I was there. Yeah, that's what I thought. Because you were in fourth year when I was in first year. I graduated okay. in, in 2005. Um, but that's funny, too, because actually you were there. I was. I did a year of classical voice at U of T in 98. And oh. then, yeah, but it wasn't my, my cup of tea. So, yeah. I yeah. But I'm glad I did it. And then um, I took two years off and then re-auditioned uh, for the jazz program. And, and started there at two, 2001. But in in that year, in 98, there was like this corner of the Edward Johnson building where everybody looked so happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a tiny corner. That's a, yeah, a good way to describe it. Yeah, the third floor of the Edward Johnson building, totally just a corner. Uh, but yeah, where we all hung out, uh, we didn't didn't have very much space back then, the jazz program. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess we were happy. I was, I was pretty scared the whole time I was at university. I don't know how you felt about your time there, but yeah, it's an intimidating experience for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, super, lots of nice people all around. I had a wonderful, wonderful time ultimately, but mm -hmm. yeah, it was, yeah, I guess I, it took, it took a while for me to believe in myself. I certainly wasn't believing in myself back then at university, you know. Yeah. So yeah. It was as you say a little intimidating, but yeah. And different times and being a female musician and all the stuff that comes with that sometimes. I don't I don't know how you feel about your time there. I'm I recognize that I was, you know, one of just a tiny handful of women in the program, but um, besides my awareness that, yeah, just our presence wasn't um, very grand, that, uh, you know, no one ever made me feel like I was um, one of just a few, which was good. You know, Paul Reed was running the program while you were there for your whole time still, right? I can't remember when yes. he, he, he hadn't retired yet when you finished. Was he, I think he may have been on sabbatical the last year, but yes, he was there for the most part. And he really, I think, contributed to a positive, respectful environment overall. I do um, too, yeah. That's, that, that was my experience from my perspective. But yeah. Yeah. yeah how, where, how many women were in the program while you were going through? Oh, gosh. Um... I'd have to count, <laughs> but you know, as a singer, it's a little different because there's more female singers, right? Then, um, but instrumentalists, well, uh, Rebecca Hennessy and Allison Young, um, a handful, but yeah, a, a great handful at that, you know. So, um, but yes, I know what you mean uh, about it being a, it's a daunting environment no matter what because it's a big university and there's yes. so much to, like there's just giants teaching you yes so, exactly exactly yeah. yeah and I mean now my advice to students is just collect everything you can while you're there you some stuff's going to resonate um while you're there but there's going to be a lot that doesn't quite make sense yet or feel as important as it might be to you at a later point in time so just collect all the info you can um, without uh, any judgment, you know, of the information that you're you're being given for the most part. You know, just, just try to stay open-minded and, and collect, collect, collect. I recognize 
of course, right, while we're at school, that we're going to grow exponentially as musicians and people through that experience of being in that program. But I, I know that once I got out of university and I had more time to digest all the information that had been um, given to me, uh, you know, when shared from our teachers, that a lot of stuff started making more sense. <laughs> and actually coming out in my playing when I had more time to work on more specific, you know, the specifics of, of what had been um, taught to us. So mm. did, you, did you, how did you feel about like school versus out of school growth and yeah, I felt relationship the to the material, you know? Took a long time to digest, it, it same. Um, I felt, it, I had a funny experience while I was there where you know, I didn't really know a lot about jazz before I went into the program. I was, I don't know how I even got in. <laughs> <laughs> I made it. I squeaked in there. And I, you know, I was at first year, first year theory class. Like, I don't get it. I don't get it. Um, and then there was this summer of first year. And uh, I didn't really look at anything over that first summer. I gave myself a, a bit of a break. And I came back into second year theory class. And everything just kind of started to set in. You know, and your brain takes so much, it, it needs time to cook that stuff on the back burner. So I felt like that was my experience. It was like, again, as you said, digest, collect, and do as much as you can while you're there. Just let it sink in. And then those years after that, I mean, like, I still think about the things that we learned at you, you know, in our program and, mm -hmm. and how to apply that and what that means to me as a, as an artist and yeah so yeah very mm. similar I think yeah it just this it's a lot of information that you get there yeah which is a fantastic which is fantastic um yeah. and I I think being young you know when we're younger too sometimes I don't know I I I, I do think sometimes I um challenged the validity of some things that were being shared at some points. And I think that was just youth. Like, why do I need to know that? You know, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, and then later, yeah, again, like years later, it's like, oh yeah, I remember so-and-so said something about that. Hmm. Yeah, it was, it was important. <laughs> of course it was, of course it was. So yeah, yeah stay, staying open-minded. And if I could go back and do it again, I think, um, I would, try to just not be so fearful, you mm -hmm. know, um, jump, jump in the deep end a little more often, take, take chances. That it's always good for growth, but it's very hard to do for a lot of people. And it was for me. Well, yeah. I mean, and that's the thing, like I've thought about the same thing, just like going back and auditing or doing it again, you know, but the, mm -hmm. the experience of our, the time that we've had to grow and since then as people and, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I know, I know, but it's a good life lesson to just go in there and, and, uh, and experience as much as you can in that moment, eh? And yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you did ask me, I never answered a part of your question because you'd asked about writing. Um, I gonna... <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I felt bad. I, no, I, no. I skipped over that. Um, yeah, I don't know about you, but I, bear, I didn't write very much music while I was doing my degree. Uh, I did for the assignments that I needed to mm -hmm. and kind of enjoyed it. Um, and for our fourth year recitals at U of T, it is encouraged to include originals. It's but it doesn't have to be all originals. So I remember I, I did write something for my graduation recital, but just like one song, like it was, I was really just, just dipping the tip of the tip of my toe, you know, into the waters, compositional waters. Um, but that's where it started. So near the end of my time there. And I had great experience between third and I guess actually I'd written a little more I what I had clearly <laughs> remembered until I I'm about to say what I was going to say that, that um 
Yeah, I clearly remember the, the song from my graduation recital and the process of writing that. But actually, between third and fourth year, I got to be part of um, a mentorship program called the Sisters in Jazz. Nice. Which was founded through the International Association of Jazz Educators, the IAJE. And so back then, that would have been 2000 and probably applied in, yeah, I applied in the late fall of 2000, and it was going to be for the IAJE 2001 conference that they chose a group of um, women who were pursuing um, whew, a, 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 a post um, post-secondary, oh, post-secondary <laughs> degree in music <laughs> performance. Nice. You, you know, you had to be in university to apply, basically, like of that sort of age bracket. Yeah. Um, and I applied thinking, eh, why not? Uh, never thinking ever that I would actually get chosen to be part of what was an um, international sextet of um, musicians female musicians, and um, three of whom that year, of the six, were Canadian, which was so cool. So it was myself and a bassist from Montreal named Karen Chatelain and Lila Bielli on piano, originally from BC, but Torontonian, Lila. Yeah. And uh, we had a drummer from St. Louis, and her name is Kim Thompson. And she went on to play with Beyonce. And I oh. think she had, you know, played with, maybe she'd already played with Kenny Barron. She was very young at the time, already, you know, sounding amazing. Um, a guitarist from Germany named Sandra Hempel. And then a, a trumpet player from Paris, France, named Arel Besson. So that group was formed and these other people were writing music. You know, Lila was already writing a lot and um, the other the other people in the group, they were they were writing and that was inspirational. I think, yeah, I wrote a couple things for that group when I think back now. So that, I think that may have actually been a bit of like the seed that was planted, really. Um, that group went on to do a, uh, the, the conference that year in, was in January in New York City, and it was a super crazy, great experience. And then the summer between my third and fourth year, the group did a European jazz festival tour. Wow. So actually in my bio, like when it said, um, you know, the North Sea Jazz Festival, I got to do that with the Sisters in Jazz. Like we went <laughs> all over the place. It was, it was, an, ama it was an amazing opportunity. Wow. And um, and hearing yeah the music that the other people in the group were were writing was really inspiring and yeah that was a really f formative uh, important experience for me. So. Oh, wow, amazing. Um, okay, and that was the Ingrid and and Christine Jensen behind that organization at the time, was it? You know, it might look different now. Um, it's because it's come back. When the IAJE um, dismantled, like dismantled, um, that obviously that program went away. But it's been brought back now through. You're right, like another um, jazz um, initiative. I just I can't remember the name of it, but the sisters are back, and perhaps the the Jensens have had some. Um, um, experience with it like they may be um, supporting that program in some way I don't know okay. but uh, it is back my um, the mentor because yes they do place uh, you know a professional mentor with the group as well each year as the band is different there's also a different mentor um, and I don't I actually I'm Ashamed to say, I don't remember the name of that person. She wasn't. Yeah, I just never. I stopped following her um, her career. She was in the states, but then the other mentor, her name was is Catchy Cartwright. She's 
She's a flautist, and she and she accompanied us on the summer tour as well. And I've you know through Facebook, the magic of Facebook, I've stayed in touch with her and have followed you know the the work that she's been doing as well. Wonderful, wow. wonderful person. Yeah, she was a great mentor. That's so awesome. You know what's funny about that story you told about your fourth year recitals? I was in the audience for that recital. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I remember. Whoa! <laughs> Holy cow! And the funny thing is, like as I've been thinking about your interview and, and preparing, I was I have been remembering that original composition that you wrote. Wasn't it for your dog? Was it? Oh, I guess did I play two? Because yeah, oh. I did Little Pepper. That was my dog. I did. It for you. Whoa. <laughs> yes. And uh, you know what? Like that was, um, you, you don't think about these things influencing other people, but it really influenced me because just to see, um, you know, a fourth year female instrumentalist up on stage performing original material. And I was only in first year at the time. Right. So that was like kind of a new concept to kind of Whoa. see that, wow. you know, and it was so beautiful and just very inspiring. So whoa yeah Thank you, Sarah <laughs> deep cuts but <laughs> yeah yeah I had written that song for um at first during that summer the mm. the sisters played it so oh, nice. sort of worked out the the kinks with with that group and then and then yeah I guess I I wow the fact that you were there and you're reminding me, you played this song because I was totally thinking of another song as the one that I wrote. So I, I guess there were two. There were yeah. two. Yeah. 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 It's a great recital. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, that was actually, I mean, yeah, as recitals go, I, I remember it too. It finally felt, I know th- through my experiences, of course, in school, but that summer with the S- Sisters in Jazz, you know, playing all summer and performing like that really helped push along my development. And um, so I remember in that recital actually feeling like things were actually like clicking and happening. Like I... Yeah, I remember it felt it felt different finally, like instead of just like a constant like struggle and, you know, panic when performing it, it felt um, I felt actually like in control for one of the first times ever, which yeah. was kind of extraordinary. So absolutely. Well, that's like exposure to, to just playing, right? Like, you know, absolutely. You it, so absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So cool. So, OK. So you started writing and then um, I guess I, I would love to hear more about like I kind of jumping now from the past to the present. Like what are your days? What are your structures like in terms of um, where you devote your time to, to writing and to arranging and which are almost the same and and playing and of course you're teaching. Like what does that sort of look like to you on an average day? Average day, uh, it feels like other things take over. So certainly now, like we're talking in September today and um, uh, again, use use the word fortunate. I'm really fortunate to have um, some teaching opportunities at University of Toronto and York University. And I'm very fortunate that despite, you know, COVID times and the enrollment numbers shifting and looking different and um, I'm quite busy, which is great. I'm, I'm getting to work with a lot of great young people this year. Um, and whereas, you know, the last, the last 16, 18 months, whatever it's been, uh, has been busy, but of course we've had a lot, more, like I haven't had like a, it hasn't felt like I've had like a job, job <laughs> constant <laughs> consistently. Yeah. And now it's like, okay, I've got a schedule. Oh, so, uh, it's a bit of, um, yeah, an adjustment. So honest, the honest answer right now is maintenance. I'm looking at maintenance. I'm finding the time to just keep my chops <laughs> on on the saxophone. I'm not writing right now, except um, sort of preparing. I'm I get to lead an ensemble at U of T um, this year, and so like preparing materials for them and sort of arranging 
for um, the particular instrumentation of that group. And then, yeah, it sort of feels like I can like day to day, I've got like a list and like, okay, I got a little bit of that, a little bit. Okay. So writing new material is not happening right now. That's the honest answer. I also, as I said earlier, you know, just finished my master's. So I was writing more consistently um, throughout the degree while it was doing that degree. And um, now I think like it's on the horizon. I'm already thinking like I should do some stuff. I should, <laughs> I should write again. Um, but I think I'm also in a time, like I'm approaching a time of maybe considering like a new group, maybe even time, you know, I'm still very much focused on the Karn Davidson nine, but I also feel like maybe, yeah, like a, a, I have not had my own small group, like a quartet or quintet for quite some time. Mm. I've, I've been focusing on different things, the Karn Davidson nine. And I also previous, um, or around the same time as the, the, that group got started, I, it's like, I don't think I want to do quartet and quintet right now. I'm going to do duets. I love playing duets. Let's just duets. And I did, do, you know, I focused on that for a while. Mm-hmm. So the short answer, Sarah, is um, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm just looking at maintenance day to day, keeping up my chops and, um, and even it's thinking about, okay, I have, this recording session then I need to prepare this also as a multi well multi-instrumentalist you know I play saxophone which um to a lot of saxophonists uh means oh you want me to double on flute or you want me to double on clarinet okay I'll do that you know so I do I do double so there's also maintenance for those if I you know the calendar I see stuff coming up then I have to chip away at that as well so and yeah i have something coming up uh, in a a month or so on on tenor saxophone so it's like okay (laughs) get that happening (laughs) that was a really roundabout way to answer your question but it's uh when i read that you know amongst your like the list of topics of discussion for today i recognized i don't have um a lot like i don't have inspiring information to to offer in terms of like i'm working on these uh, chord progressions and new structure song form structures and nope i'm i'm really just trying to to keep up my chops while you know earning a living which i'm very lucky to be able to do that with the teaching so I'm just juggling. It feels like right now, especially, yeah, post-pandemic, everything's starting to come back. It feels like I'm juggling numerous balls in the air and really not wanting to drop any of them. So Mm. housekeeping is uh, happening. Wow. And yeah, I feel that too. There's an energy in the air right now where everybody's adjusting like, and Mm -hmm. and same, like we're all getting back into social circles, into in-person and even like, I don't know, going to a, a, a gig and, and listening to music. And it just, it's a lot to take in um, and adjust to. And it takes up a lot of headspace and plus teaching and all the things that you're doing. I can't, I can't imagine. So <laughs> you teach, yes? Yeah, I teach online. I just, um, I teach online, of course, but. Um, well, yeah, but... I guess these days, unless you're masked and far away from one another, I don't, as a vocalist, right? Yeah. Um, so I teach private lessons out of my home and my, the studio that I use, so where we live in St. Catharines, I'm really fortunate that we have, fortunate (laughs) that we have, (laughs) um, a separate structure in our back. It's like a converted shed basically. Oh, okay. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's not, it's like a medium sized room, but, um, not great ventilation. So mm. s- singing wise, I don't know, I'm going to have to, if I do finally start to bring people back in person for singing, I'm going to need to plexiglass and air purifier and do all the things. Yeah. Um, and then I, I teach like beginner intermediate piano too. And that's a whole other thing. And a lot of the people I'm teaching are still unvaccinated because they're under 12. Oh, of course. Yeah. 
So it's yeah. like a whole, it's a whole thing. So I'm just yeah. keeping everything online for the, for the time being until the dust settles. Yeah. And we see where things are going. But um, yeah, there's been a flurry of, of organizing and business and I'm feeling that same, a, a little bit of that same current that you're, <laughs> yeah. but yet not with like four, five reads that you're soprano, alto. Yeah. So, soprano, soprano, alto, tenor, flute, clarinet. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. And the reality too, like I, I got a call last month asking if I could play a show. That's something I've done in the past uh, is play, you know, and for musicals. Nice. Uh, and I enjoy doing that. And the call was asking if I could play clarinet. Yes. And baritone saxophone. Not quite, you know, so um, that's next on the menu. Like I'm going to, I, I want to work with this production team, so I've agreed to, to take it on. So, wow. yeah, why not? Why yeah. not? <laughs> Comes up. It's funny, the, the two extremes, <laughs> you know, the small clarinet. Not bass clarinet, but clarinet, and then, <laughs> and then Barry. Okay, okay. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I do very much like playing in musicals, and, you know, being able to, to double c- comes with, you have to... Be able to do that. I was actually supposed to play with the Stratford Festival last year. It would have been my first time getting to work with that um, company. I was going to be playing Chicago, oh. and uh, it had piccolo and clarinet and soprano and tenor in the book. And I got to do two rehearsals with uh, with the show. And then the lockdown, so that was that was uh, disappointing. I mean, I was just one of the people in the what would have been a wonderful orchestra. I was so looking forward to playing with them. But then, like the whole company, the the cast and the crew and the managing side of it, like the you know theater companies, whew, yeah, they all had to do a one eighty. It was challenging time so hard times yeah absolutely but it is disappointing it's disappointing for everybody so yep hopefully hopefully that'll happen in another incarnation at another time and that's all we can say (laughs) yeah (laughs) maybe next time (laughs) maybe next time yeah we're all yeah wondering (laughs) what was that sorry maybe next time (laughs) oh yeah totally well done yes (laughs) Wait, no, that's Cabaret, isn't it? Not Chicago. I think you're right. Yeah, that's yeah. Cabaret. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> same vibe, same vibe. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you mentioned this in your bio, but I read, maybe it was on your website, about um, your time down in New York with Dick Oates. What yeah. Oh, so God. the whole thing about when I was, I was too scared to ask Kirk McDonald for lessons while I was at University of Toronto. And then when I finished the degree, I was like, oh, okay, let's, you know, let's keep learning. Mm-hmm. So I saw him when I was done. And that, I just kind of kept that theme going of um, pursuing more input from more perspectives um, as I've gone along. And it's been great for inspiration and motivation and just different stuff to work on. So um yeah i i applied for the ontario um arts council's chalmers professional development grant way back in 2013 i think to study with dick oates i had heard dick oates for the first time because of kelly jefferson who um you know when he did his master's degree he went to manhattan school of music and dick oates was teaching there at that time and i think that was possibly kelly's first exposure to oates um and then fast forward years later we're teaching at a camp together and he you know put something on some some music on and hey td um try any guesses who this is and hearing oates play for the first time it was like 
it may have been um, him playing on like someone in love from uh, Standard Issue. It's one of his albums. He did Standard Issue and Standard Issue Two, which were all all standards. And it just sounded so great. It's like, who is this? This alto sound and this language and uh, approached articulation. And of course, I couldn't. I didn't. I wouldn't have been able to answer. You know, Kelly, like, who is this? I was like, I don't know. It kind of sells. It sounds like Miguel Zanon, but then it's got some like traditional language components that like remind me it could be like Cannonball, but it's obviously not Cannonball. Like it was this fusion. And um, oh, it's it's Dick Oates, and oh, Dick, Dick Oates. So tell me about, tell me about him. Like, and so, and then I just, yeah, Oates uh, infused my 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 listening uh, lists for for quite some time, and I was really inspired. I you know I was lifting him, lifting solos on my own time, and just you know, Kelly had conveyed that Oates is a really nice man, you know, maybe you should reach out. He gave, Kelly gave me his email and I, I, I reached out and asked if I could study with him and hey, there's this grant because you live in New York and it's hard, you know, to afford to be able to come see you with too much frequency. And I don't want to live in New York, adore New York, but I didn't want to live there, you know, just mm -hmm. with life um, on the go here. And it worked out. I got the grant, and thanks to the Ontario Arts Council, I I went back and forth six times and and studied with him. And yes, hugely inspirational, and gave me lots of new things to consider and work on. And you know, one of those lessons was on flute, also, for example, because Oates has played in the Village Vanguard Jazz Orchestra for over 40 years, it was, you know, he joined in the seventies when it was the Mel Lewis, um, Thad Jones, uh, big band. I can't remember when the, um, change to, to be the village Vanguard happened, but you know, he sounds amazing on flute and, and soprano. He, he joined originally actually that orchestra on tenor saxophone. He was, and then he moved eventually to the, to, to the lead alto saxophone chair. And, um, he's certainly one of the great uh, all time lead alto saxophonists out there. So t yeah, it was a great experience. Wow. That's amazing. You know, what's funny too, is just the other night, um, Rob and I, uh, have been kind of making a habit of watching concerts from the before times, as they're called, um, on YouTube. And we found one of, we were trying to do a New York City night. So <laughs> we ordered pizza and we like, we're like, okay, let's watch something that was filmed at the Vanguard. And, uh, and it was the Village Vanguard Orchestra celebrating 50 years. And there was cool. the Oates right in the, in the front center and, uh, John Mosca and, and, um, Jerry Dodgian was a special guest. It was amazing. Anyway, it was like a great concert and yeah. Yeah. And, and just like two nights ago, we were, we were watching. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and now we were talking about, um, putting a face to the name of Dick Oates. Uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's, it's a special band and a, what an incredible musician and what an opportunity for you. Like, to, so you went back and forth, eh? You went. Yeah. We'd okay. make little trips of it. Um, and because he he I don't know where he's situated now. It's been, you know, several years since uh, I completed those lessons, but uh, he lived in Nyack, New York. So not New York, New York. <laughs> it's outside of New York. Uh, I had to take a train from Grand Central up the East Hudson to Terrytown. New York and then he would pick me up from the train station and then we'd bloop, bloop, drive just a little ways to, to Nyack and um, have the lesson at his home and then drive me back to the train and take the train back and wow. yeah I mean uh, um, a couple times you know of, of the half dozen trips we chose to make little vacations around it I mean we, you go all that way and 
taken as much music as we could while we were there, shows, and try to schedule it sort of maybe that it might fall around a Monday so we could go to the Village Vanguard and, and hear Oates play with the orchestra. So, it, yeah, it was a fantastic experience. And uh, I learned so much. I One of the projects for my grad degree, actually, the composition degree, the final thesis if you will is that actually for this degree it's a a major research paper which is written um to accompany uh, a major compositional work your final major co compositional work so i chose to do um a two-part uh i love saxophone <laughs> uh works where i yeah part one was dedicated to Joshua Redman, and then part two was dedicated to Dick Oates. Oh. So I, I wrote a piece for him <laughs> for uh, for this Karn Davidson Nine, actually. So hopefully going to perform those in November. The Karn Davidson Nine is supposed to perform at the Rex nice. at the end of November, which will be um, the yeah CD release. So these pieces aren't on the new recording. I should I should specify you. Okay. The your tune uh, on the duets album, Train to Tarrytown. Right. Wow, okay. you're good. You well, did research. <laughs> I was totally <laughs> listening. Holy. Well, no, because that's that. Um, for some reason, like uh, I was just bits and pieces of of your, but yeah. the title stood out to me, and I thought it was like something to do with Chris Terry or something. Oh you're wow, with Mike Murley, right? Right. Yeah, I never yeah. got to play with Chris Terry actually. I mean, I went to hear <laughs> Metalwood, like a bajillion times. Right. I loved Metalwood. You know, yeah. when we were. Around that time that we were in school, like the early 2000s, Metalwood was really active and kind of popular. And so I heard Chris Terry play a lot. But yeah, Terrytown is for Terrytown. Like it was, um, I'm going to get lessons with Oates now. I'm on the train up nice. East Hudson all by myself to go get lessons. I hope this works out. Um, <laughs> cool. Mm -hmm. So the, Karn, the third Karn Davidson 9 recording is about identity in a way, you could say. Um, William and I were inspired to write music for our families. And this uh, concept actually came about when Canada's 150 was on the horizon, that celebration, and the Canada Council for the Arts actually had some really large grant opportunities available for large commemorative, um, they wanted large scale projects. Um, uh, yeah, because of 150 and that time, at that time, I think that was 2017. And it just got us talking about our own families a lot and our family's relationship to Canada what you know what it means to be Canadian to us and we decided to apply for for a project for for that uh, Canada 150 grant but uh, it didn't work out but the concept was yeah writing a suite we would each write a suite of music for our families and um, we've always, you know, our rec recordings, the two that we've done, it's a 50-50 band, you know. So there's always um, half the record is William's songs and half the record are my songs. And so, yeah, we thought this would be a great balance, like if we each presented a suite to reflect our family history. And so we started writing and the grant project didn't work out, but we'd already you know, the seed had been planted and we were moving forward with that. So we um, started picking away at the writing. It was a slow process. At that time in our lives, it was actually a very busy time and we did get a little distracted, but always like, we got to do this. This, mm -hmm. this could be a great project. And so we kept um, working towards that and it all kind of came together actually last year. You know, everyone was... I think a lot of us were, were very reflective uh, during during the pandemic and lockdowns and um, 
we were no exception. And um, I had started to write some music for my family already um, after my dad passed away at the end of 2015. Um, that next year and a half it took me a while to get back actually to music and writing after my dad passed away it was um, a little bit of a hard hard time getting back but when I did I, I did write some music for him and um, and during the pandemic William got to writing and he he started writing about his family's um, story of of immigrating to Canada his um, mom and dad are from Hong Kong and they came, they came to Canada. They made their way over to Canada starting in, uh, you know, the late sixties. And, um, and so, yeah, he wrote music for them and, and that story of immigration and, and finding a new home. And I finished up my suite. Um, my mom passed away when I was a, a little girl. And I finally wrote um, what felt like a appropriately large and meaningful piece that, that I could muster for, for her. So my suite is for my mom, my dad, and for the Davidson family, which is Scottish. And um, so that's my suite. And William's suite is um, for, for his parents and their and their. Um, story of finding a new home and then the connective tissue actually between between the two suites is um, a song that William wrote for Murphy who passed away this summer so that was a, a new addition to the recording that he got done just in time uh, for the for the recording session so it's really about family and identity and it's our most, most personal project for sure that we've they've, we've ever done like certainly with the, our band but i have to say like also our smaller group projects it really feels the most personal thing we've ever done oh, wow. oh my gosh that's beautiful i can't wait to hear it hopefully hopefully our stories and you know the emotions and the thoughts behind behind the stories that they they translate um to the listener as well they make sense to us but you know we've been living with this music <laughs> we've shared it with the band obviously they've they they played um so wonderfully we're so we're so pleased it's all it's all ready to go um but uh, yeah we we hope that listeners will enjoy it too you know of course right I think um, the the honesty and the you know the real raw emotion that comes out of projects like this is it's it's gonna come out. It's gonna, people are gonna feel that. So I hope so. Yeah, I hope yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. What a project. So exciting. So um, you recorded it at Revolution back in July, and yes. you had a little um, documentary made. Is that sort of yes. So there was a documentary, a piece um, that's that got filmed while we were recording at Revolution. My brother uh, is a um, a TV person, and he's a director and uh, DOP and cameraman, and um, he he's in that line of work. And uh, it's hard it's hard to get my brother actually in the calendar, you know, um, but he agreed to be, um, the coordinator, but behind, uh, getting this, this film made for us. And, uh, so he was there in the studio with us, you know, but behind the camera and, and sort of directing for, yeah. Um, there's, yeah, he, you know, he conducted interviews to ask, ask us about the story behind the music that we were making. And uh, of course, there's behind the scenes footage of, you know, actual the band in action yeah. uh, in the studio. But it'll be it'll be more of a, a story with the music as the soundtrack in the background to uh, to tell the story of why we why we <laughs> why are we making this music? Yeah. Um, and yeah, can't wait to see it. It's it's being edited it edited still yeah. um, so we're excited to see that amazing what a great idea because uh, it's such, such an important project and uh, and to have that family connection involved 
in, in that. Yeah, that was the special. Catcher, though. Yeah, that's beautiful. This is our third recording as an ensemble, and this project is very personal. It's the most personal recording we've done so far. It's going to be titled The History of Us, and it's really about family and identity. The Cardin Davidson Nine is led by myself, Tara Davidson, on saxophones, and my husband, trombonist William Karn. Thank you so much, Tara, for being a guest on Artistic Digs. It was really, really lovely to chat with you. And thanks for sharing all the amazing stories. It's awesome to hear. Thank it. you so much for having me, Sarah. It was really nice to see you. It's been too long. And uh, I appreciate the invitation. And, uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. My pleasure.